Senator James Bennett. Thank you. Um, I had anticipated, Bill, that you were going to introduce our other two panelists as well. Um, we have Asa Hutchinson, former congressman um, and uh, former uh, uh, official actually conducting the, the, the um, drug war on behalf of the U.S., to put it in the most broad possible term. Um, and Ethan has been fighting the fight against uh, drug legalization, I mean, for in favor of drug legalization now for how many years have you been in this? Long time. Battle. Um, uh, has made a career of this. These two men have faced off on this subject before, um, but are, uh, we're very happy to have both of them with us today. I wanted to start off by giving a little bit of um, context for this debate. Uh, if you'll excuse the expression, with a little potted history of marijuana law in North America. And then I'm going to ask you all, if you don't mind, since these guys are putting themselves on the line today, to, to give us a show of hands for how many are in favor of legalization and how many are, are against. We'll come to it in a minute. You can prepare. You don't have to do it yet. And then I'm going to take another vote at the end. The first marijuana law was passed by the Virginia Assembly in the very first year of its founding, actually, 1619. It actually compelled every farmer to grow marijuana because hemp was seen as strategically important. It was used to make sails and rigging and caulking for wooden boats. Although a number of the founding fathers, including George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, would grow marijuana, there's no evidence that they knew anything about its less nautical applications. <laughs> in the second half of the 19th century, Marijuana became a popular ingredient in patent medicines as a cure for migraines, rheumatism, and insomnia. It wasn't until the early 20th century that the government clamped down after the political upheaval in Mexico led to a wave of immigration. Police officers in Texas said that the traditional means of intoxication for these immigrants, smoking marijuana, led to violent crime. Anti-drug campaigners spoke of the marijuana menace, and in 1914, El Paso, Texas, enacted what was probably the first U.S. ordinance banning sale or possession of marijuana. By 1931, 29 states had followed, followed suit. In 1937, Congress passed the Marijuana Tax Act, effectively criminalizing uh, marijuana throughout the U.S. A week later, an unemployed laborer named Samuel R. Caldwell became the first person convicted under the statute. He was arrested and convicted in Denver. Um, he got four years at Leavenworth. Today, under federal law, cultivation and distribution of marijuana, including giving it away, uh, are all felonies. Possession for personal use is a misdemeanor. Possession of paraphernalia is also illegal. Cultivating 100 plants or more carries a mandatory minimum <coughs> sentence of five years. Now, a word on, on public opinion, which has actually moved up and down over time. According to Pew Research Center in 69, 1969, only 12% of Americans favored legalization. Uh, over the course of the, 70, of the 70s, that uh, approval grew. Then it dipped in the 1980s before beginning to rise again and then rise rapidly over the course of the last 10 years or so. Just three years ago, only 41% favored legalization, and today 52% did. So let's start out with this room. How many come into this debate in favor of legalization? Show of hands. How many are opposed? And is there anybody whose mind isn't made up on this subject? Okay, great. All right, well, let's plunge in. And Asa, I'd like to start with you. Um, so you can smoke a cigar. You can't smoke a cigar, but you can. Um, uh, in Colorado, at least the voters have approved the idea of people being able to smoke marijuana. Uh, what, are the, what are the health effects here? Are cigars, in fact, more dangerous? <coughs> Well, both uh, smoking cigars, smoking cigarettes, and smoking uh, uh, marijuana gives you uh, carcinogens. And uh, that's the reason we have education campaigns against uh, smoking, uh, so that uh, we don't have the adverse uh, health consequences. And so, sure, it is clearly an adverse health consequence of, of uh, smoking uh, marijuana. Everybody's body and uh, the amount, all of those things make a difference in terms of the consequences. But, uh, you know, you have uh, cognitive issues, you have uh, productivity issues at work, 
Uh, you have uh, restrictions on driving while under the influence. Uh, so clearly, uh, and that's not to say it's uh, you know, 100 times worse than alcohol or, or uh, uh, some other drug, but it, is, it does have <clears throat> adverse health consequences, and that's uh, been acknowledged by the medical community. But you also know that from uh, personal experience. I approach this as a law enforcement person. Uh, I was a federal prosecutor. I was head of the DEA. Uh, I was in Congress that had oversight responsibilities, and I've traveled to Columbia, and I've seen all aspects of our fight against illegal drugs. Most importantly, I've seen it as a parent. And uh, as a parent who's raised uh, three sons and a daughter, uh, you worry about these things, and every parent does, and uh, I think parents know that there's adverse health consequences as well. Ethan, and I'm afraid I didn't give you your formal title earlier. You're the founder and executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance, um, which is the leading organization in the U.S. seeking alternatives, really, to the war on drugs. How do you respond um, on, well, that, on the health I'm not, I should start, James, just by clarifying even though California, Colorado voted to legalize marijuana, you're still not going to be able to walk down the street smoking a joint. It's not going to be legal to smoke it in public, just, and it will still be more restrictive, in fact, even in public than smoking a cigar or cigarette. So you'll be able to smoke a cigar out in a park or something, but not a joint, uh, although maybe local authorities will shift on that. So we should be clear about what's happening here. And I think, look, where I agree with Ace on this is on the following. Um, I, too, am a parent. Uh, most of us here, I think, are parents. And we're all concerned about young people using these drugs. We're concerned about them getting involved with alcohol in a problematic way or other drugs or the pharmaceuticals that may be in the bathroom closet. And we're concerned about marijuana. I think we're also more and more realistic because if we were to have a show of hands here and ask how many of you have smoked marijuana, I think probably half or more. I don't know if you want to ask that question right now, James. Um, uh, even with the former head of DEA yeah, sitting here. You're asking yourself. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, but the fact of the matter is what's happening, I think, is a lot more pragmatism in, in, adult, in our parental generations. We focus on the real harms. We're concerned about safety. If our teenagers go into a party or they're going off to college, we want to know that they're going to get home safely at the end of the night, right? We're worried about booze and worried about young men getting reckless and violent. We're worried about getting, you know, high on the roads with marijuana or alcohol. But we're also we're worried about young people, you know, waking and bacon, right? It's waking up every morning, smoking before you go to school. That's a problem. We see that. But quite frankly, the simple consumption of the occasional joint, uh, you know, on a weekend or whatever, I don't think we're all going to get worked up about that. And where I agree with ACID too is there is evidence that smoking marijuana can be harmful that mostly applies to heavy use of marijuana. There's very little evidence showing that the occasional use of marijuana is problematic. And I think part of what we had through the whole war on drugs, the war on marijuana, was the conflating. Talking about the harms of marijuana while focusing on the small minority of consumers who are waking and baking, smoking all the time, being stupid about it, and ignoring the fact that most people who use marijuana don't have a problem with it, aren't hurting anybody else, uh, are going on to lead perfectly fine and otherwise law-abiding, respect respectable lives. Uh, and in fact, you know, we look at three people who used marijuana when they were younger, and they're now in the White House. So if we want to talk about marijuana being a gateway, maybe it's the gateway to the White House or something. I mean, <laughs> but, but a cocaine or heroin. Asa, would you expect usage patterns to change um, if, if, in fact, it were legalized across the country? Uh, they would increase. And you, you know that from logic, but also from history. In the 1970s, Alaska uh, <coughs> decriminalized uh, marijuana. And uh, it, it increased in usage. Parents got concerned about it. And then in the 90s, they recriminalized it. They went back the other direction because of an increase in use. Uh, you see that also in, uh, well, look at alcohol. Uh, I mean, in, in the comparison is always made about prohibition. Well, when prohibition was lifted, did alcohol consumption increase? Absolutely, without any question. And the same thing would be true with uh, marijuana use. Now. Uh, I think you have to be more concerned about what it would do with teenage consumption. And uh, I think you, you look at uh, the experiment with the Netherlands, uh, the indications are that the uh, consumption of, of illegal drugs, marijuana, went up with the uh, decriminalization, and they had tightened it up, closed some of their uh, cannabis coffee houses. California, even with their 
medical use of it uh, is dramatically increased among uh, all groups. So I think it would. So Ethan, what do you say to that? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm and I'm, by the way, yeah. now going to be using the expression waken and bacon all the time, but I, <laughs> as, 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 as the father of two little boys, it, it concerns me too. Yeah. What, what, are we going to see spikes in, well, in well, usage? Well, I mean, here's what, let me just uh, uh, clarify a few things Ace has said. I mean, first of all, back in the 70s, 11 states decriminalized the possession of small amounts of marijuana, which means they turned it into a civil fine as opposed to a, something you get arrested for. And what you saw was that marijuana use went up in those states during the 70s. It also went up in the states that did not decriminalize in the 70s. And during the 1980s, it went down in all those states. So the best research on this was an article by a guy named Eric Singel in the 80s in a referee journal basically showed that decriminalization did not have any impact on levels of marijuana use. Similarly, the Netherlands, which you know, legalized, sort of legalized the retail sale of marijuana in the late 70s, early 80s, They've had this coffee shop system now for 30 years, not just in Amsterdam, but almost every city of any size in the country. And marijuana has gone up and down a bit. They've, sometimes the coffee shops, there were too many of them. The government closed down some and back. It's more or less been a stable system for 30 years. Rates of marijuana use right now among young and older people are much lower than they are in the US with our much more repressive policies. They are roughly at the average as far as Europeans go. And a lot of the European countries have more repressive policies. So this notion that liberalization will lead to huge increases, it's not borne out by the evidence. That said, the fact that we're now moving from decriminalization to actually legalizing it and selling it, allowing it to be sold in licensed outlets, which is what Colorado and Washington will do in the next few months if, uh, if Washington, D.C. doesn't say no, I think there is, as ASA says, a risk um, that marijuana use will go up. Right? It'll be less expensive. It'll be easier to get. But I don't think the real risk is among young people. Why? Because there are now three national surveys in which young people say it's easier to get marijuana, easier to buy marijuana today than it is to buy alcohol. Every high school in America, marijuana use is a bit more or less omnipresent. You know, the surveys, for the last 30 years, 80% of young people say it's easy to get marijuana. So I don't think that's the group where it's going to go up. If anything, you're going to take away some of that forbidden fruit attraction to marijuana. Where marijuana use is going to go up, it's going to be people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. It's going to be older people going, damn, it helps with that arthritis, and I didn't realize it. Or it helps me sleep at night. Or I actually find I prefer it to having a drink at the end of the night. Or you know what, I prefer it to the, to the pharmaceuticals my doctor's giving me for my mood or my anxiety or whatever. So I think that's where we're going to see the increase. It's going to be among older people most of whom are not going to be prone to being addictive or using it in a problematic way, that's where we'll see the likely increase. Do you buy that, Asa? I think there's, a, there's an argument that uh, uh, teenage use, because it clearly under a legalization scenario, it will still be illegal for teens to use it. And so that's an unknown as to uh, the dynamic there. Uh, but what we do know is that uh, the attitude of leaders make a difference on teen attitudes and like right now part of the reason there's an increase and uptick in teen use is because our leaders and in states like Colorado and Washington State say it's okay and there's talk about medicinal use and so you see anything identified with medicine whether it's uh, prescription drugs in the medicine cabinet or whether it's marijuana that somebody hey I heard that was good for you uh, it, it goes up and it changes teen attitudes now as to whether parents can clamp down Law enforcement can clamp down to make sure there's not diversion of, uh, uh, of, of marijuana to teenagers. That remains a law enforcement question, which goes back to an argument, well, we don't want law enforcement focusing on marijuana. They will be focusing on marijuana because there's going to be increased access, and you don't want it in the hands of teens. It's an unknown, but clearly in every other age group it would go up because it's a legal substance. Well, I'm just going to say, I mean, I, I, look, none of us want teens using marijuana. But the fact of the matter is, it's widely available today. If you ask who has the best access to marijuana today, it's young people. Who had the best access 10 years ago? Young people. 20, 30, 40 years ago, young people. And you know what? 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, whether we continue towards national legalization or not, it's still going to be young people whether we like it or not. So I think the key there needs to be less obsessing about 
we can't build a moat, right, between marijuana and teens. We can't do that. The focus needs to be on keeping young people safe and on coming up with smart, sensible regulatory policies. I think honest drug education, too. I don't think all this demonization and all these myths that the government's been putting out around marijuana for decades, I don't think that helps. I think it was a mistake when government was saying that marijuana is so bad that young people did, you know, tried marijuana, didn't believe them on that, and then they didn't believe the government talking about heroin or cocaine. I don't think that makes sense. I think honest drug education is probably going to be our best bet. By the way, the only data I could find on this question seems to cut both ways. It goes back to 2010, according to the administration, in, uh, there were 2.4 million new past year users of marijuana then, the, and the average age of initiation had increased from 17 in 2009 to 19 in 2010. On the other hand, the rate of past month marijuana use among 12 to 17 year olds climbed 7.4 percent, well above rates in the immediate previous year. So it seems to be um, cutting in both directions. You both have mentioned leadership, and I, I kind of wonder if this is going to be a point of agreement. I wonder if either of you is satisfied right now with the leadership from the White House on this question. And how do you reconcile the federal law now with state law in, in Colorado and, and Washington? I mean, those are two very big issues. I mean, I'd say when it comes to political leadership generally, it's weak on this issue. You know, if you look at the Gallup poll on legalizing marijuana, and you look at the Gallup polls over the last 10 years on legalizing gay marriage, marriage equality, they line up almost exactly. From roughly one third of the country in favor about 10 years ago to slightly more than half in favor now on both issues. But then you look on gay marriage, and what you see is you now have the White House, many senators, governors, others in favor, significant members of Congress in favor. Whereas on the issue of marijuana legalization, not one member of the U.S. Senate, maybe two dozen members of Congress, and that's a huge jump from only two guys a few years ago, Ron Paul and Barney mm -hmm. Frank. And the state legislature is beginning to change, so what you see is still a lot of trepidation and fear. This is very much an issue which is being led from the, no pun intended, grassroots up, right? Um, uh, and with Obama, I mean, Look, I, I feel for the guy in a way. I mean, you know, these controversial hot button social issues are not typically ones where the White House leads, right? And mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is, even with Colorado and Washington, the president does not have the power to order federal prosecutors not to enforce federal law, right? He can't say to the U.S. attorney in Colorado, do not enforce federal law. What he can do is provide leadership in terms of saying, here's what we regard as our priorities. What he can do is to say that the people in these two states have spoken. And they didn't speak by a squeak, right? In both Colorado and Washington, it was 55% of the electorate voting to legalize marijuana. In Colorado, the vote to legalize marijuana got more votes than Barack Obama did, OK? <laughs> and in Washington state, it got almost as many votes as he did, and more than the Democrats who won the race for governor and attorney general. So I think what he can do is to say the people have spoken, and we want to find a way to allow these two states to work this out in a responsible way. That's what I hope he'll say. It's what I hope the Attorney General will say. And I think they can't quite figure it out, which is why it's taken them so long to say anything. What do you think of the White House's leadership here? Well, it, it's uh, silent to a large, to, the, to a total extent, it's silent in reference to Colorado and Washington State and what the federal policy on enforcement is going to be. Uh, there's some easy solutions that I think that they could address. Uh, but, but overall, President uh, Obama is very clear in the international leadership. He does not, he's thinking very carefully, does he want to leave as his legacy uh, legalizing marijuana, not just the United States, but leading the international community down that path? Uh, President Obama, whenever he went to the Summit of the Americas this last year in Colombia, he said that it is okay for us to debate the pros and cons of the war on drugs. But I personally, and my administration's position, is that legalization is not the answer. This is what the president has said to the international community. Why is he saying that? Because uh, he, he does not want the United States to go contravene every treaty that we've entered to, into and led the international community to. Now, let's, let's come back to Colorado. Uh, if the the administration has been silent on the Colorado and Washington State initiative as what the federal government's going to do. And this is the first time in history that we've had a state setting up a uh, regulatory regime 
that totally contradicts federal law. So you're going to have the state of Colorado engaged in basically a criminal enterprise to, uh, uh, in a, uh, a systematic way to assist uh, in distri distribution of marijuana. And the Justice Department has been silent on that issue. If they remain silent, legalization will be the law of the land in a majority of the states within five years. There's a lot at stake in what the position of the administration will be. Certainly, if you think that's the right way to approach, then uh, President Obama can do that. You've also, though, got the issue that he's uh, been sworn to uphold the Constitution and federal law, and it's hard for me as a uh, former Justice Department official to understand silence that we're not going to uh, enforce federal law. And it's not a heavy-handed issue. The federal government doesn't need to come in and start arresting Colorado citizens. That's not the issue. Just like they did in, in uh, uh, Arizona, uh, the federal government can file suit to have a declaratory judgment that the state law and regime for marijuana distribution violates federal law and ask for an injunction. No one's arrested, no one gets excited, it's just a declaration of what federal law is and that what Colorado is doing through their state regime is uh, in violation of federal law. <coughs> So a lot rides on it, and uh, so far he's silent. Well, let me just correct one thing. It's not actually the first time um, with the Colorado law. This is not the first time the state has set up something in contravention of federal law. In fact, the first time was with medical marijuana in the last few years. And what you had now, there's now 18 states that have legalized medical marijuana, where you can get marijuana, um, and it's not a crime if you have a doctor's recommendation. And there's a good chance that Illinois and New Hampshire will become the 19th and 20th in the next few weeks or months if the governors sign those bills on their desk. There's a million and a half to two million people now with a legal medical marijuana recommendation. And if you look around the states, what you see is you have states like Montana or California where the state failed to set up a regulatory regime for that. And that's where you see the federal prosecutors being fairly aggressive. But then you look here in Colorado where the state set up a very responsible regulatory system for medical marijuana a few years ago. They have a Colorado State Medical Marijuana Enforcement Division. They've hired former law enforcement to regulate it. You look in New Mexico, you look in some of the New England states, they have tight regulatory systems. It's not like you see in the newspapers with Los Angeles where people can get marijuana with any type of you know, hangnail or whatever it might be, right? And what you see is in those states, the federal prosecutors are not doing anything. And the DEA is hanging back. And you more or less have the White House saying, look, if this is being effectively regulated, we don't need to go after it. So what Colorado did with medical marijuana a few years ago by legally regulating it the way it has, and what New Mexico and other states have done, that does provide a model for what Colorado and Washington are now trying to do. The other point I just want to make here is, you know, we're focusing on the health consequences of marijuana and about um, what legalization might look like. But the reason why I'm in this is not because I'm a pro-marijuana person. And it's not because I think legalizing marijuana is such a wonderful, great thing, right? There are risks associated with it, as I and Asa would agree. I'm in this because I think that arresting 750,000 people a year for marijuana possession is a terrible thing to do. I think giving millions of Americans a criminal record for simply having a joint is a ridiculous thing to do. I think having this business be in the hands of organized criminals in Mexico and the U.S. and other countries makes no sense. I think that foregoing the tax revenue while putting in the hands of criminals makes no sense. I think having people growing it illegally in national forests makes no sense. I think that having people be disqualified from access for student scholarships and public housing and other assistance because they once had a marijuana condition makes no sense. I think people have been legal immigrants in this country for 20 years getting kicked out because they get popped twice for possessing a joint is inhumane and cruel. So the reason I'm doing this is not because I think legalizing marijuana is such a great thing. It's because keeping it illegal is an atrocious thing. And whatever risks there are to making marijuana legal are less than the risks and the harms of continuing with the failed prohibition policy. I think um, you've lost control of the debate. No. I, well, I actually want to come, I'm going to come back to that speech you just gave in a moment, but Asa, I'd like to actually first hear you address, I'd, I'd like to hear you first address um, how successful you think the regulatory regimes of marijuana, have, medical marijuana have actually been. I don't mean to be facetious about this. People with severe medical conditions have said marijuana has been a tremendous benefit to them. On the other hand, I've had occasion to travel a fair amount in Colorado over the last couple of years, and I read 
the uh, alternative weeklies and so forth in the towns I go to, and I see all these marijuana dispensaries competing on the quality of the munchies that they offer, the brownies and so forth, and it seems like people have been probably accessing those, those uh, dispensaries in some cases for, for non-medicinal uh, purposes. I wonder what your view is. Well, it hadn't worked. Uh, I mean, the bottom line is that uh, both the agenda for medical marijuana has been outright legalization. I mean, that is, uh, it is the legalizers that have pushed the medical marijuana not for compassionate care, but for ultimately getting to uh, marijuana being legal across our country. And so whenever the regime in California or other places, uh, anytime you have, uh, you know, a, a, a medical, uh, something like a backache, which is totally subjective, and you can have marijuana for that, you're going to have extraordinary abuses in it. And, uh, and, and, and so you're not having any good regulatory scheme or enforcement scheme on it. And the fact is that uh, in the Bush administration, there was a declaratory judgment type action that federal government does, federal law does uh, supersede state law when it comes to uh, the distribution of marijuana or the regulation of uh, medical marijuana even. So I, I think it's been poor. That's why California has really uh, tried to tighten it up. Some of the uh, communities see the abuses and they're uh, either outlawing it or trying to pr pr uh, provide restrictions for it. But the debate today is not about medical marijuana and I would be the first one to say that if there's a patient and that has a need and the medical community says this is a good uh, solution for it, medicine, and, and then it, they ought to be provided that way, absolutely. Uh, if that is the case, but the medical community has not said it to date. Now, so I don't think uh, the how we've handled medical marijuana is a lesson as to what happens whenever you go into full legalization of marijuana. Okay, I'm going to open it up to you guys in a, in a moment, so please start thinking about que what questions you might want to ask. Now I'd like to return to what Ethan said a minute ago. Asa, you, you were George W. Bush's first DEA administrator. I mean, has the war on drugs, particularly with reference to marijuana, just been a costly mistake? Um, and aren't we in a position to realize, not only save a lot of money on incarceration and so forth, but raise a lot of money, and this is an argument that one hears, um, through tax revenue if marijuana is legalized? Our democracy is not gonna fall if you legalize marijuana. Uh, but I think you have to ask yourself, what is the best thing for our country? And uh, you, you can take two approaches to it. You can say, well, there's been some mistakes in past policy on marijuana enforcement, and so we ought to adjust those policies. And that's actually what's happening all across the country. Uh, it's such a small, minuscule percent of people who are particularly in federal uh, custody because of uh, a marijuana possession offense. It just doesn't happen. Uh, and, and so, but look at it, you know, Texas, Arkansas, many states are looking at incarceration policy, making adjustments, and you've got to be a pretty serious uh, drug offender in order to go to jail uh, for, uh, you know, breaking the law. And so you can adjust current policy. We've, we've done it with drug treatment courts so that we're putting more money in the treatment side and alternatives to incarceration for those that have an addiction problem. That's the path I would like to see. If you see mistakes made, let's adjust those. And I think that's what Europe has done. Uh, Europe uh, has not moved toward decriminalization uh, across the board. Uh, Latin America has not moved toward decriminalization. They've simply moved toward adjustment of their enforcement policy. Uh, but the other path is let's legalize it. Now let's think about what happens if you, if you legalize marijuana all across this country. One, I think it would generate tax revenues. I'm on the conservative side, and there's a lot of libertarians who don't believe in, in strong government but support marijuana legalization. It's ironic to me that uh, if you legalize marijuana, what are you going to create? A huge government bureaucracy. That's what's happening in Colorado. You've got to have licensing authority. You've got to have tax collection authority, you've got to have enforcement authority. So you're going to create a huge regulatory body in every state and the federal government if you legalize it across the board for, to collect the taxes and to make sure the enforcement is there. 
Arkansas, we have the Arkansas Lottery Scholarships, lottery money coming in, in which funds our scholarships. Well, we're going to be having pot scholarships uh, because you're going to have revenue coming in that's going to generate it, and uh, the public's going to sell it because you're going to be able to send your kids with scholarships based upon uh, a marijuana tax revenue. Uh, you're going to have retail shops. You're going to have distribution. You're going to have cultivation, all highly regulated. That's the path we've got to go, I believe, with increased harm. So two paths you can take, and I think the best one is keep it criminalized, keep it illegal conduct, but let's make the adjustments uh, from lessons that we've learned over the last two decades. Well, I, mean, I, I got to say, you talk about expensive bureaucracy. You know most expensive bureaucracy we got? It's the prison industrial system. And it will not change if you, you legalize marijuana because you've still got enforcement on heroin, uh, methamphetamine, and a whole host of yeah, other drugs, and that's not going to be solved unless you legalize everything, and that's a bad idea. The fact of the matter is, I mean, roughly half of Americans between the age of 17 and 65 would ever try marijuana now. Not that many Americans are interested in trying heroin, cocaine, or methamphetamine. <laughs> And what you see in the public among, we've done the polling on this and the research, what you see among a lot of people who are on the fence around this stuff and are worried about their kids and maybe they use marijuana when they're younger, maybe they didn't, they're basically saying, we want the cops focusing on real crime. And quite frankly, the cost of having some bureaucracy to regulate this in a responsible way is well worth it. If we can be bringing in billions of dollars of revenue and that revenue will in fact go to pay for school construction or other services, that's a trade-off that we want. We don't want the criminals getting that sort of stuff. So I think this notion about, oh my God, we're going to have another bureaucracy, better to have a marijuana legal regulatory system, which in Colorado is going to be in the Department of Revenue, in Washington it's in the Alcohol Control Bureau. That's the way to really deal with this stuff. I mean, meanwhile, spending what we're doing now, $10 billion, $15 billion a year enforcing these marijuana laws, three-quarter million marijuana arrests. And I'll tell you this, too. I used to wonder whether just decriminalization would be enough. The European approach the Euro that well, yeah, was describing. Kind of. Yeah, exactly. And then you look what happened. 1970s, you had, as I said, 11 states decriminalized the possession of marijuana. And initially, the arrests dropped, right? But you know what happened? By four years ago, in California and New York, both of which had decriminalized the possession of marijuana back in the 70s, you had more arrests than you had back in the 70s. Because even though marijuana had been decriminalized, police found new ways to arrest. And who were they mostly arresting? Overwhelmingly, it was young men of color. Every city and county around the country, when you survey you know, white kids, black kids, brown kids, and you say, who's got more marijuana? By and large, the same percent are going to have marijuana in their po pocket, white kids, brown kids, and black kids. But all around the country, it's young black kids, and to some extent brown kids, who are getting arrested at three, four, seven, ten times the rate. So the problem with decriminalization was police still found ways to keep arresting people. They kept doing it, and decriminalization still keeps it in the hands of the criminals, the black market. So that's why I'm saying let's make this legal, let's regulate it. And by the way, now in Europe, you have now in Denmark, in Switzerland, Spain, the Netherlands, they're all now looking at the U.S. and saying, whoa, U.S. is now leapfrogging us when it comes to a pragmatic cannabis control policy. So they're beginning that debate right now themselves about how to effectively legally regulate this stuff. United States leadership does make a difference. It does. All right, I'd like to go to the audience. Are there questions out there? I think their microphones, their microphones are now set up, actually. So if you would please go to the microphones and line up on both sides of the room. Um, I'm sorry, they weren't there a moment ago when I looked up. I'm going to ask, since this is a debate and we've got a, we got a, a small enough group here, I usually say no speech making. I still say no speech making, but if you want to express an opinion, that's fine. I'd love you to get your whole question out in a paragraph, though. So why don't we start over there, please? Hi. Um, I was just wondering, one of the things that was not addressed today was the health risks and the information that my teenage children tell me you can have alcohol poisoning, you can't die from pot, but you can still die in a car accident if you're high. Um, and possibly, if marijuana was legal, there would be a lot of um, regulations like Xanax, Oxycontin, you have drugs that you're told are bad for you or that could be addictive or there are problems. And that's one of the things that legalization might help with is more information. And you all didn't really talk about, you did say carcinogenic, one of you, the very first things, but um, the, the young people especially don't see any downfalls brain development, and a lot of other things, um, in addition to the fact that it is addictive. 
um, that's not, it's sort of overlooked. John, John Hickelooper, the governor of Colorado, was here a couple of days ago, and he actually, you know, he opposed the referendum. It was passed over his opposition. And one of the things he's very concerned about, he said, is long-term memory loss in kids, and they're not aware of the, the hazard there. Ethan, what do you, what do you say about the, the health risks of marijuana? Well, as I said earlier, the health risks of moderate or occasional marijuana use are virtually nil. I mean, the one exception will be people who maybe have a, uh, you know, are struggling with mental illness, and that's where marijuana can sometimes be really problematic. But the problems really are heavy use. And so there was a significant study a year ago which suggested that if you use a lot of marijuana when you're young and you keep using a lot of marijuana when you get older, that that can reduce your IQ, right? Now, a subsequent study challenged that. And other people pointed out that the same study suggested that if you're a heavy user of marijuana when you're younger and then stop when you're older, or if you did not use when you're younger, but then use when you're older, you don't see the impact on IQ. When it comes to driving, uh, driving, what you see is alcohol is far and away the worst. But one clearly should not drive under the influence of marijuana. I mean, the evidence shows that whereas experienced marijuana users driving on the road, it's hard to tell the difference between an experienced marijuana user driving and somebody who's not high at all, that if you're a novice user, if you're using a new batch or whatever it might be, that there are risks with driving under the influence of marijuana. Finally, on memory, in terms, once again, Heavy use of marijuana can have some impact on long-term marijuana, on, on long-term memory. But what you see, and, and also short-term memory, so for example, when, when you're high, the stuff that you learn when you're high, you are going to be less likely to remember the next day or the next week. When you're high, you can remember stuff from the past as well as somebody who's not high. But it's the stuff you learn while you're high that you forget. That's why going to school, studying, doing things like that while you're high is a bad idea. Okay? But when it comes to the evidence about long-term memory stuff, there's very little evidence showing harms in that area unless you are smoking 24-7 for very long extended periods of time. I actually think you made a pretty good argument against legalization right there. Uh, that's a lot of harm, in my judgment, and potential harm and risk for our society to take by the legalization model. But to the lady's very appropriate uh, question, uh, you know, we, we have drug education now. It's, it's uh, funded federally through the Office of National Drug Control Policy, known as the Drug Czar's Office. And that funding has been cut uh, significantly in recent years and so you're not hearing the same type of drug education messages for our young people as a result you see some uptick education makes a difference uh, some of the uh, uh, programs in the schools have been diminished as well but clearly uh, the governor of Colorado taking a lead in this saying we've got to have drug education if we're going to have a legalization so you're going to have to do that. I think it's important whether it's legalized or not to have that drug education, but it's probably even more necessary in terms of the uh, health consequences, and not just for the teenagers, but for the adults to prevent the heavy use that you're speaking of that has some very long-term consequences. Yeah, I mean, I just want to say also, I think Hickenlooper is providing something of a model because he opposed this initiative on the ballot, but he then very clearly followed through in good faith about trying to implement it. He just signed the implementing legislation last month. He's lobbied the Justice Department for permission to be able to implement this thing, and he's focusing on where the real harms would be. We don't want to see more young people getting in trouble with this stuff. We don't want to see more accidents on the roads. But we also don't want to see our young people getting arrested. We don't want to see this thing out of control. We don't want to see unregulated marijuana. So the challenge really is about coming up with that balanced marijuana policy. Let's take two from over here. Please. You know, I really don't understand the brouhaha about pot. I actually don't smoke it, but it's a sedative. And it's much less of a sedative than alcohol and Valium and all the other drugs that the adults in this society are using. Now, am I going to let my 15-year-old drink? No. Am I going to let my 15-year-old smoke pot? No. But if my 16, 17, or 18-year-old walks out and somebody hands them a, um, a joint, I don't want them to have a criminal record. And then I'll tell them, listen, you know, this is the reason you shouldn't be smoking. Or this is the reason you shouldn't be having five glasses of wine. But look at the adults in our society and ask yourselves, is this a much more criminal behavior than, than having six shots of whiskey? I mean, this is what's okay for the Senate when they go out to their parties at night. So, so Asa, I think that's a question probably to you. I mean, <laughs> why, why is, you know, why shouldn't we leave this to the parents of America? Why is this the government's business? 
Well, it is the first responsibility of the parents. And uh, the, the concern you expressed is that if you have a teenager that's given a joint by someone else and smokes that joint, you don't want them to have a criminal record. And uh, under our system, uh, it's, uh, they're not going to be arrested. Uh, they, they, you know, could be, uh, you know, repeat offense. It could be going into juvenile court or it could be some school disciplinary matter. Usually it's dealt with between the parent and the, and the school and that type. If it gets into much more serious problem, there's more serious consequences. Uh, but you're going to have that uh, challenge if you legalize marijuana and uh, someone gives your 15-year-old uh, a joint and they smoke it, guess what? It's still a violation of the law because they're underage. And so nothing's going to change in that regime. You know what, though? They're going to get it anywhere. If you but, ask any parent in this, in, in this room, their kids are saying, I'm getting this stuff. And the only thing that stops them from, from having this at this age is, is parental influence and talking to them. But beyond that, it is a sedative, and it's, it's a less dangerous sedative than alcohol. It All right, doesn't thank you. Create, can I stop okay. you there because we'd like to get to some other questions? But Ethan, can you okay. want to respond to that? But specifically the point Asa made that nothing really is going to change. Her, well, her child might still you know, wind up with a criminal so record. The evidence we're beginning to see suggests that even though the laws apply in, California, in Colorado and Washington to people 21 and over, what we're seeing, in fact, it, it appears to be seeing, is that police are less likely to be arresting people under that age as well. So even though the law doesn't technically apply to the below age 21, that's the, the change we're seeing. I'll tell you this, though, that it goes to the questions I asked before about the risks of, of marijuana and other drugs. One thing about marijuana is you cannot die of a marijuana overdose. And if you do become addicted, first of all, a smaller percentage of people get addicted to it than with many other drugs. And if you do get addicted, the harms of the addiction are less than other drugs. And it's easier to put that addiction behind you. The thing I'm most worried about now is the opiates, not just heroin, but the pharmaceutical opiates. We've seen the number of people dying of an overdose related to pharmaceutical opiates or heroin increase fourfold over the last 10 to 15 years. As many people died of an accidental drug overdose last year as died of an auto accident, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about it, out, the thing about opiates is if you combine them with alcohol, that's how people can die, and that's how young people can die by accident. With marijuana, you combine it with anything. It may make you sick, nauseous, tired, but it's not going to kill you. You sleep it off, and you wake up okay the next morning. Do you want your 15-year-old using marijuana? He says, I said before, I don't want my teenagers using any drugs. And my message Will with young people... Will it be a criminal offense? No, but let me just Will say, it be a criminal offense? That's, that was really the question. But, but my, I don't think young people should go to jail for, for, for marijuana, no. I don't think they should go to jail. I don't make it available to them. I don't think, but it's like with cigarettes. I don't think kids should be using cigarettes either. I think treat marijuana more or less the way we're treating alcohol and cigarettes, right? Strong Strong, smart public health measures, education measures, good taxation, restrictions on time and place, good education. My message with young people in drugs is, first, don't do drugs. My second message is, don't do drugs. My third message is, but if you do do drugs, there's some things I want you to know. Because my bottom line as your parent who loves you to death ultimately is not, did you or didn't you? My bottom line is, are you going to come home safely at the end of the night and grow up and make me healthy grandkids? That's my bottom line. But Ethan, just so I just to understand it, it's, I, I would like to crystallize this, this question of fact. Is there anything under the Colorado law that will put her child less at risk of winding up with a criminal no, record as, as a I consequence? No, as I said, nothing, nothing specifically addresses okay. the issue of under 21. It's really more that as you change the law for adults, the police are less likely to be arresting people age 18 to 21. Okay, next question, please. Um, I just wanted to say, I work in the addiction field for many years. I've never seen a child or any age die of an overdose of marijuana. I see our kids dying and people of all ages dying from the use of prescription medication that is legal and is prescribed by our doctors. There's this, this issue is more complicated than just legalizing marijuana. We have to look at the education that we're doing on drugs, we have to look at the, at, at the instruments that we have to treat addiction, which are miserable in the country, except for people who have a lot of money to pay for treatment. And Could you we, move to a question, please? I'm sorry. And, and my question is, instead of getting caught up in all this discussion about what is the bottom line if we were not going to take a double standard with marijuana and prescription medication, in terms of what will happen to, crim uh, to, to crime in our country, uh, having legalized 
drugs or not a black market. Let's put it that way. Eliminating the black market is what I mean. Will well, it eliminate the black market if we legalize marijuana? Is that the question? Uh, that's part of the question because right now, even we have the legal um, drugs that are prescribed by doctors, there is a black market for that too. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's the thing. Uh, I, I don't think you can make a logical argument that you're going to reduce incarceration costs, law enforcement costs by legalizing marijuana because you, you're going to have those that are going to try to sell outside the market. Uh, you're going to have the same, you know, the DEA, will they diminish one iota because you're going to legalize marijuana? They're going to be able to focus. Maybe that's a, a good argument for it, but they're going to be able to, you know, it's going to be uh, heroin, it's going to be the prescription drugs. So there's always going to be the enforcement responsibility, whether a specific drug is legal or not. That is still going to be the case. Uh, I think you're going to have actually increased law enforcement expenses under a legalization regime of one drug. Uh, and uh, the only way that you're really going to eliminate that if you legalized all drugs, which I don't think very many people, except for Mr. Nadelman, actually would advocate for. Well, actually, and even I'm not advocating for that. I mean, my organization, the Drug Policy Alliance, we're the leading organization in the country, probably the world, of people who are advocating against the war on drugs. What I would say is that most of our members, and, and I for that matter as well, we don't advocate for treating heroin and cocaine and methamphetamine the way we do alcohol or cigarettes or the way we're arguing marijuana. We have some libertarians who are supporters and some people who want to legalize everything, but we have a lot of people who don't want to legalize anything, who say decriminalize, treat addiction as a health issue. If I were to sum up the overall objective of drug policy reform in one rather long sentence, it would be this. It is to reduce the role of criminalization and the criminal justice system in drug control to the maximum extent possible while protecting public safety and health, right? So I think about drug policies as a raid right along a spectrum from the most punitive, lock them up, you know, pull out their fingernails, cut off their heads, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, to the most free market like we had with cigarettes 50 years ago. And I think the objective is there's no inherent role why the criminal law and the criminal justice system has to be front and center in dealing with these drugs. One of the lessons of Europe is that you can put the health people in charge. You can put the surgeon general in charge rather than a military general or a police chief. You can treat these drugs primarily as health issues where law enforcement plays a backup role rather than a frontal role. And that means in the end, Let's take marijuana out of the criminal justice system, responsibly regulate it, you know, tax it, control it. It means, secondly, with respect to the possession of other drugs, do what Portugal's been doing for the last 12 years. Nobody goes to jail for the simple possession of a small amount of any drug. The, the production distribution is still illegal, but the evidence from Portugal shows that they've reduced the cost of, 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 of drug enforcement and drug use has not gone up, and drug addiction and HIV and Hep C have all gone down. Any drug whatsoever. Of any drug. What they say basically is if we catch you and you got a little bit of heroin cocaine on you or marijuana, whatever it might be, we are not sending you to jail. We are going to send you to what's called the dissuasion committee, where you talk to people Whoa. with expertise in, in health. No, I've got to tell you, <laughs> Portugal <laughs> made a real commitment to treating drug addiction as a health issue, right? In the Nathan, United States, we, we say if you use drugs, you're going to lock you up if you don't stop. Portugal said, we're not going to do that. We're going to send you to a committee. We're going to try to get you help. If you have an addiction, we're going to treat it as a health issue. That's what we're going to do. If you're really a bad guy, if you're really committing other crimes, then we will arrest you. We will lock you up. But we're not going to put you in jail simply for possessing or using All right, let's, drugs. Let's try to get a couple more questions in. Over here, please. All right. So I'm asking my questions. You said to introduce ourselves. Uh, I've sat on a state trial bench since 1986 in a city, Baltimore, where 10% of our population is addicted. All these years later, 27 years later, having created and sat on drug courts and having sat in civil and felony courts, why would using a health model, an education model, appropriate regulations, criminalization for certain types of selling and distribution not work 
in preventing the serious public safety and health issues, as well as the significant discriminatory effect. And that's really important in a city when one sees the people who are going to drugs, jails, who are being charged are young people of color and who has, the panel has mentioned, come out with badges of felony and misdemeanor convictions that cut off so many future opportunities. Why wouldn't it work? And who else is working on this to make it work or at least explore ways? Asa, I think that's a question. No, it's a great, it's a great question. Uh, and I agree totally that uh, whenever we have an addiction problem in our society, we need to address the addiction problem. I'm a strong supporter of, of more funding for the uh, addiction and the treatment of those uh, that have drug problems. Uh, but what you see is that what compels someone to go into treatment? You'd like to think that they realize they got a problem so they're going to go into treatment. They got an addiction problem or that the family comes to them. But in 90% of the cases, what puts somebody into treatment is when they get arrested and they're confronted by their law enforcement officer and then they go to treatment. And that is, you mentioned the drug treatment courts, uh, that's where they have the accountability. They're going into the addiction, uh, the treatment program, but if they're not uh, staying clean, if they're not reporting, if they're not staying employed, if they're not taking care of their family, then that judge very well could put them in jail. It's an accountability program. But I've been to those drug treatment court graduations where uh, whenever the, after a year long treatment, uh, they get through that, they graduate, they go over and they hug their arresting officer and say, you're the one that got me on the right path. So you've got to combine the enforcement side with, with what triggers the treatment side. Enforcement doesn't always necessarily lead to incarceration and it shouldn't. And the, and the addiction, it could be somebody's committing burglary who's got an addiction problem that's identified or writing bad checks to support their habit. In law enforcement, you've got to identify uh, the, uh, that it's an addiction problem and put them into the treatment side. You mentioned the discriminatory uh, uh, outcome, and uh, that's always a great concern. I mean, part of it is economics, part of it is, is poverty. I mean, you've got, why, why do we have more of, uh, of minorities that are in poverty? Well, there's a lot of reasons for all of that. We have to look at our enforcement to make sure that we're being even-handed. That's one of the reasons I supported the uh, changing of the uh, cocaine, uh, crack cocaine disparity because it had a racial disparate impact. That law was changed by Congress, and that's an example of things we need to fix, things we need to do better, we need to learn, and if there is a, uh, 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 you know, a, a poor outcome for minorities because of this, because of some uh, inappropriate enforcement policy, we need to change that. But wait, actually, John, I just got to say something here. I don't think all that's right. First of all, we have a two-tier system in this country when it comes to drug treatment. If you have money, if you're white, if you're affluent, by and large, the criminal justice system is not involved with you or your drug use or drug addiction. You're finding ways to deal with that outside the criminal justice system. If you are poor or oftentimes black or brown, the odds are the criminal justice system is the only way you're getting access to drug treatment. And that's not the best way to do drug treatment. The criminal justice system is not a good drug treatment provider. Also, Asa, when you say that most people don't go to drug treatment or don't get rid of their addiction without the criminal justice system and a judge holding a hammer over their head, you know, you ask heroin addicts what's the most addictive drug of all, you know what they say? Cigarettes. But in fact, half of all Americans who have been addicted to cigarettes have quit, and the vast majority did it without being coerced and with no judge holding something over their head. Then you look, as I said before, at the Portugal model, where they are dealing with addiction more effectively than we are without holding any hammer over out of anybody's head. And with, instead of putting the money and billions of dollars into the law enforcement you side, said, you no, wait said, a second, you instead, said instead, they instead, they instead, respond, instead, instead of putting the money into the law enforcement side, they're putting it into the health side, All right, let him, where the resources him, belong. Give him a chance, and then you, let's you get one more question. Well, you previously here. said that in Portugal, they were arrested, but instead of putting them in jail, they put them into their re-education program. No, I didn't say program. they were arrested, Asa. You, a, no, they no, are no, stopped a, by a law enforcement officer. That, for, to me, is an arrest. No, no, but they're not arrested. They get no criminal record what to speak of. It's a total, system totally different than the U.S. 
Let's go over here, please. For yeah, I think there's one question that we haven't really addressed. I'm a psychotherapist here in Aspen, and I deal with young people. I'm in the trenches, so I, I talk to these people day in and day out. Um, a lot of people here, young people, are starting very young and, and using it way into adulthood and beyond, uh, you know, young adulthood. And um, I'm seeing people that are really just dropping out of society. They are losing ambition. They are dropping out of college. They uh, don't have jobs. Uh, they are young parents, and um, they have anger. They have psychosis. They have schizophrenic-like um, uh, actions. Uh, and I'm really worried. I feel like one-tenth of the people I'm working with do ha will have no fu futures at all, and they will be on the sidewalks, or their parents will have to be uh, supporting them. And I think that's one thing we have not addressed, and I think it's a huge issue in the United States. And because I feel like you, you all have not experienced it, you don't know the reality of it, and it really is frightening to me for our nation. How about that, Ethan? Well, well, what I would what's say the, is, you, you I'd ask, like to so hear Ethan respond okay. to that first. Though. I mean, what I would say is, um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, and I've talked to many, many people struggling with addiction. Many of the people involved in our organization are people who have seen the worst that drugs can do. And what their conclusion is, is that criminalizing these people who are struggling with their lives, with their children, with their families, with mental illness, with all these things, that criminalization is not the right approach. We now have a half million people behind bars who are mentally ill. That's not the right place for people struggling with mental illness. We have people struggling with trying to get jobs and stuff like that, and drugs are out there, alcohol is out there, they're all problematic. But I think, look, we've built a, a prison industrial complex in this country that is the most extensive and most expensive one in history. And not just, you know, in absolute dollar numbers, but per capita. I think the real answer to dealing with the sorts of problems that you're encountering and the people are struggling in families and all this, it's not going to be by pouring ever more billions of dollars down the rat hole of the criminal justice system. It's going to be by dealing with those issues directly as health issues, as mental health issues, as job training issues, in those sorts of ways. You know, I think that's really where we need to focus, not through the criminal justice system. Asa, how do you react to that question? And then I think we're going to have to proceed to a well, vote I, and wrap it up here. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think all of her points are, are, are very accurate. I mean, the incredible uh, consequences of, of addiction, even of marijuana, that you're speaking of. And uh, uh, I think the question that we have to ask as a society uh, is, one, uh, is this going to get better or worse if we legalize marijuana? My judgment is it's going to get worse, not better. And uh, the second question is, if we keep it uh, illegal, then how do we address that problem? And I think we obviously need to continue to put resources into the treatment. Uh, we need to do greater education and, and uh, address it like any other society problem. So thank you for your question. All right, I'd like to ask you guys, if you came in here opposed to legalization or uncertain, have you had your mind changed by this conversation? Any hands? There's one. Okay, and how about the other way? If you came here in favor of legalization or uncertain, have you had your mind changed the other way? So we haven't moved this crowd very much. <laughs> it shows maybe how much, uh, how, how rigid positions already in, are in, on the subject. But thank you guys for making such strong and knowledgeable cases on both sides of the question.